Before we begin this podcast, please be advised that the following episode contains language that some listeners may find offensive and inappropriate. The opinions expressed by the host and guests are their own and do not reflect the views of the podcast producers. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the tale of Anthony Frenzel. Last time, a moment of distraction turned to disaster. Anthony made it out of the car wreck mostly unscathed, while the other driver died instantly. We pick up the story just days later, as the consequences of Anthony's actions loom large on this episode of Voices of a Killer. So, whenever you got done at the hospital, the state trooper was there to talk to you at the hospital? Yeah, yeah, he came up to the room. How did that go? What was, did he just say, hey, I just want to ask you some questions about the wreck? Did he say, I want to charge you with this or that? Or what did he say? He just wanted to ask some questions and go over like my timeline for the entire day and what I did from, I think, the night before all the way up until the accident. And he probably wanted to know if you had taken any kind of prescription medication, illegal drugs or drink. Did he ask you all those questions? Yeah. What did you tell him? I told him no. You just, you lied to him, said you didn't do anything? Yeah. So how long after this occurred did it, did it come out that you had meth in your system? I don't know if it ever came out or has. Uh, not in any of the reports I got. Okay, so how long after this incident were you charged with, what was it, vehicular manslaughter? They're, they're charging me with second-degree murder. Under the grounds of what? They're saying that the truck I was driving was stolen. Oh, shit. Yeah. So... Your crime has nothing to do with having meth in your system and, and killing somebody in a traffic accident? Uh-huh. Well, I'm in for a surprise. I thought this entire thing was about you. No wonder I can't find okay. anything on the internet about drinking and driving. However, okay. there really is nothing about a stolen vehicle either. So so tell me about this stolen vehicle. Was it a stolen vehicle? I, I bought it from somebody, and it turns out it was a stolen vehicle. But I didn't know it was, it was stolen. You didn't do the proper stuff with the title and all that? I hadn't gotten the title for it yet. You did get a title I hadn't finished paying it off. No, no, I had a bill of sale. There's no title. When did this, how long after this wreck did they charge you with second-degree murder? About a year and a half. Took them about a year and a half to graduate to come back. You were free for a year and a half with nothing? I was free. They gave me a parole violation, probation violation, sent me to prison. And then I got out, and they gave me the parole violation. Uh, but I was out for so hold on. Uh, three or four months. Yeah, so hold on a second. You you get out of the hospital, and then they violate your parole, you said, or a probation violation, right? Yeah. What was the violation for? for because of the wreck? I think, yeah, a laws violation, yeah. and then a reporting violation. So, okay, so what was the laws violation? And for the listeners that don't know, laws violation is... You didn't violate your parole. You actually broke a law that applied to violating your parole. I guess I said that right. So what was the law that you broke while you were on probation or parole? Driving while revoked. So you were actually driving while revoked whenever this accident happened? Yes. And they put you in prison for a few months on that violation? Yeah. And you still hadn't been charged with second-degree murder yet, right? No, not yet. They they sent me to diagnostics. And they gave me a, a year setback, and then during that time, they, they charged me. The troopers came up to the prison and filed charges for the second degree murder. Wow! So you were in there for a parole violation, and then while you're in there, the state trooper came and officially charged you with the crime. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Oh, I was wrecked, but I was expecting it. So I was expecting something, but. Not necessarily that. Well, I was expecting DUI with, with somebody that died involving a car wreck. I, you had meth in your system, but what is the... So, why do you think they charge you with second-degree murder? It's hard to say. I bet it is. I think some of it's got to do with, with, with who the, the guy is. He The tow company he was working for is the tow company for that county. So, he was well-known. And, and I... I'm hoping that they charged high, so 
So if they can, they'll try and take a, a plea deal of something lesser, or they could probably start high, and then I'll give some room to come down. Well, whenever you got charged, did you have any family or friends to call and say, "Hey, I just got charged with second degree murder while I'm in prison"? Oh yeah, I got a, a handful of like my stepdad and my a couple friends of mine, and that? they were, they were shocked. Yeah, their reaction was probably shocked. Have you been to trial yet? No, I'm still in the process. Wow. So you're not even actually sentenced for this second degree murder yet. You've just been charged with it, right? Not yet. Wow. Yeah, this is a first for Voices of a Killer because you're actually not convicted as a killer yet. You're just blamed for being one. Wow, man, you got some crazy stuff ahead of you. How how are you dealing with this right now? It's a little easier now that it's been almost two years since they charged me. In February, it'll be two years since I got the charges. I went from a level one institution thinking I was going to be getting out in a couple months at death row camp. Yeah, all my security on with all that. Yeah. So whenever, because you said you went to diagnostics, and usually diagnostics is where people figure out where they're going to go uh, from there. They basically say, okay, you got 20 years, you're going to go here. You got five years, you're going to go here. So you're at diagnostics, and you went, you get charged with that, and they ship you straight to Potosi, which is a level five death row camp. That's crazy, man. How are you getting along in there? Not too bad. At, at first, it was it was way different than anything I'd ever experienced. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. When is your court date? I go back to court in January. Anthony flips the script on our interview when he tells me his case is still unresolved. It's been nearly three years since the crash, but Anthony still has no answers. His fate is still undetermined. Nobody really thinks about the period of time between which you're charged and sentenced with a crime. It's an afterthought, a prelude to the main event. But since the day he was charged, Anthony has been stuck in a three-year-long state of legal limbo. For years, he's been a pawn in the prison industrial complex, batted back and forth between institutions and now tossed into a holding cell at a maximum security death camp. Now, at long last, a court date has been secured, and Anthony's wait is almost over. The charges he'll be facing are particularly harsh. Typically, you'd expect to see an involuntary manslaughter charge in a case like this. That's standard recourse when somebody's been killed due to reckless driving. The law evokes involuntary manslaughter when the driver didn't intend to kill, but is still responsible for a death because they were intoxicated, negligent, or in Anthony's case, inattentive to the road. Instead of manslaughter, the prosecutors are looking to nail Anthony for something bigger, second degree murder. If found guilty, Anthony might be looking at 30 years in prison, possibly with no parole. That's a little steep and Anthony has one theory about why. The victim in his case was an employee of a high profile towing company and Anthony suspects they were able to leverage for a harsher sentence. Whether that's true or not, prosecutors are known to pursue the harshest sentence they can, even if it's frankly unreasonable. To do that, they'll spin a narrative for the jury and paint the defendant in the worst possible light. For a regular working class guy like Anthony, He'll need to prepare well to ensure the prosecutors don't succeed. More on that after the break. Here's the thing, man. They know what they're doing. They're charging you with this, and they're going to keep you in there forever. And the prosecutors are going to keep putting this off. You'll do it at least three years probably before you go to trial. But the thing is, man, you are responsible for killing somebody. I think if anybody, and, and, and a lot of times this is what we do out when this happens, we all put ourselves in that family's shoes. And just as if you were to put yourself in that family's shoes, you'd probably want yourself dead. You know what I mean? If somebody hurt your kid or your father, or your mother, you know, that's, that's very painful because of something, a mistake you made. How do you feel knowing that people probably hate you for taking their loved one's life? It's, it's hard, especially knowing some, a little bit about the dude. I had dated his sister previous to this a little bit and I got some messages from the family while I was still out let me know how they felt about everything so was it like hate mail oh yeah but justified and understandable they, they write you do the same letters. thing they write you these letters while you were locked up or you said you'd gotten out a little while no it was it was before I got locked up while I was out a week or two after the accident 
They wrote they wrote you a letter to your house. No, they they got a hold of me on Facebook. Wow, per, a private message. Yeah, and then three days after the accident, I met his best man at a buddy's house and, and talked with him. Scary. I thought he was going to kill me at first, but we sat and talked, and he offered me some form of comfort. He said, "Do I understand it was a, it was an accident?" It was what it is, but that was a that was a rough conversation. What do you think should happen to you because of this? Honest opinion. You have to you have to take yourself out of the situation, which is nearly impossible. But what do you think should happen to you? Definitely give me some time. I'm good for some time. I, I'm hoping not the amount what circumstances involved. I'm not trying to do a life sentence over this, but I'm more than willing to give him some time. What do you think the prosecutors are going to go after you for? What do you think they're going to try to try to do? Because they can go pretty hot uh, murder. And also, uh, by the way, I think it'll end up getting reduced, but that's how they play their game. They start really high, and then before you know it, you're going to get something lesser than that. But I think they're going to try to they're going to try to get your head. You know what I mean? They're going to go as as good as as much as they can. So, what do you expect? Right now, when they filed the charges, they sent like a like an offer, not an offer, but what kind of what they was thinking. And it was 15 years and 85% on the second degree murder. And I'm hoping to get, uh, I'll pull you out if they'll drop it down to a voluntary manslaughter. Yeah, man. It's so crazy how quickly a life can change or multiple lives just from crossing the center line. I'm going to have to reach back out to you again as this progresses to find out what all happens to you and, and pay close attention do you have a paid attorney or public defender? Public defender. And that, that's another turning point for for you because I think if you had a hot shot attorney, you could get some shit done. But and yeah. and, and, I, and for the record, I don't think public defenders suck or anything. I just think that they're so overwhelmed and they get they get the least amount of funding compared to like prosecutors and shit like that. It's just, it could be, I think it can make or break a, a case uh, a lot of times. And unfortunately that's the part of the justice system that's flawed is somebody in your situation with money can really take care of this stuff. But it sounds like you're just at the, at the uh, mercy of public defender. How does that make you feel? Yeah, it's, it's, it's stressful because then the public defenders have, an enormous case mode for one. So there's are spread thin and it's it's hard just getting a hold of my my attorney. See a lot of people don't understand out there and for people that are listening should really listen good. A lot of times people that are in trouble, it's not that they're trying to get off. They're just trying to not get completely screwed out of something that they're they don't want an enhanced charge. They want the charges that are done to them, not anything more take for instance second degree murder or vehicular homicide or or involuntary manslaughter those things are big differences and sometimes a good law, an attorney are the ones that are going to determine whether you get the enhanced charge or you're going to ride with what you got and then of course the cases where people are completely innocent too but a lot of people don't realize those things it's a good attorney can be the the difference between 10 more years on your sentence or or not in a perfect world, our justice system would be 100% objective. Every criminal case would abide by the letter of the law and the sentences would be proportionate to the severity of the crime committed. Unfortunately, the system is flawed because it's made up of humans, the judges, prosecutors, and juries who decide these cases are not impartial and they can interpret the gray areas of the law in vastly different ways. That's why many times I've seen two similar cases have totally different outcomes. It's particularly hard for the regular people who can't afford lawyers like Anthony to be fairly represented in court. Anthony tells me his case is in the hands of two public defenders and this has already put him on the back foot. While perfectly competent, his public defenders are overworked and simply don't have the time to give his case the attention it needs. At the time of this recording, we're still yet to hear about the outcome of Anthony's trial. The court date has since passed and we'll endeavor to give you an update sometime in the near future. But whether Anthony is facing five years of 15 in jail, this split-second car accident has disrupted his life forever. He is no longer the same Anthony who acted recklessly and dismissed the warnings of those around him. Before closing out this conversation, 
I wanted to hear Anthony's thoughts about how this crime had changed him for good. So, Anthony, do you f- feel like if you were to get out today or 10 or 20 years from now, you would do exactly what you told me you did after your first and second DWI? You, you, you just drink again and drive? Absolutely not. So whenever you took your classes for the first DWI and you went through the second one, they were trying to tell you in those classes, hey, this is what can happen to you when you drink and drive. But you basically said that you that stuff went through one ear out the other. What makes you think that this doesn't work either? Actually, it's like too late. You, you, you already did kill somebody. That's what they were trying to teach you. How does that feel knowing that that's exactly what those classes were trying to do? and you went and did it anyway. How does that make you feel? It, it makes me realize a lot about being all pig-headed and dumb and thinking I know know things, and it puts, it puts other people's knowledge and experiences into, into proper perspective. Like, the the arrogance that I had isn't it's just being stupid. So here's what I'm going to do, man. I'm going to say that this is a wrap for our interview with you having this case pending and everything. I'm going to pay close attention. I hope that you continue to uh, feed me information as you get it. I'm pretty indifferent in your situation. Like I said before, we put ourselves in that situation where that was my loved one. I would probably want you dead. But uh, also, judges are supposed to make, they're supposed to judge not on emotion. That's why we put them there and and they're not supposed to use their emotions. They're just supposed to use logic and, and, and the laws and stuff like that. I hope you continue to reach out to me and uh, let me know what's going on. But uh, I wish you the best of luck, Anthony. And uh, All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll keep the number in my address book, and I'll let you know kind of what goes on when something goes on. All right, man. <clears throat> wish you the best of luck. Just uh, let me know if anything changes. I really do want to know, okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep in touch with you whenever something yeah. something worthy happens. <laughs> Have a good one. God bless. Yep, see you. Bye-bye. On the next episode of Voices of a Killer. And he turned around and pointed at me and said, wait right there. As soon as I get my gun, I'm going to kill you. The demeanor in your voice, it doesn't sound like somebody that would have put a few bullets in the two different people. He took about two or three quick steps and grabbed my nephew from behind. And I noticed that he had a knife to his throat. He had a knife to his throat. You know, and... and while I, I've, I've always claimed my, my defense of self-defense, I recognize that I should never have went there in the first place. It was supposed to be a fist fight. That's all we went for. It, it was just bad all around. I, there, was, there was no win. That's a wrap on this episode of Voices of a Killer. I want to thank Anthony for sharing his story with us today. His ability to be open and honest is what makes this podcast so special. If you want to listen to these episodes weeks in advance, you can now do so by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash voices of a killer. There you will get access to raw interviews, unseen news coverage, and unique correspondence with the guests of Voices of a Killer. Head over to patreon.com slash voices of a killer to support the podcast. Your support is what keeps us passionate about bringing these stories to you. A big shout out to Sonic Futures, who handled the production, audio editing, music licensing, and promotion of this podcast. If you want to hear more episodes like this one, make sure to visit our website at voicesofakiller.com. There you can find previous episodes, transcripts, and additional information about the podcast. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Your feedback helps us improve and reach new listeners. Thank you for your support, and we can't wait to share more stories with you in the future. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Toby, and we'll see you next time on Voices of a Killer.